but welcome to the fourth annual Community Justice Academy. I am Annie Kern with the Marion County Prosecutor's Office, and I am ready to get this program started this year. You know, someone said, oh, they were going down the hall and they said, are you ready? I said, ready is the word. I can't say excited or thrilled because, seriously, because of the topics. Does that make sense? It's serious topics. Things that we will be discussing that are uh, very serious, very intimate to some of our folks. Um, the Community Justice Academy is our effort to further uh, educate and engage residents, local agencies, uh, civic and faith organizations in crime prevention strategies and the criminal justice process. So when I say I'm ready, we're ready to get this started. We've been planning uh, for months to, uh, to have the fourth uh, Justice Academy. The topics covered during the fourth, during the four Mondays are not part of our regularly um, scheduled programs that we offer. Anyone here ever attend our burglary prevention program, our cyber safe, or our, our fraud prevention? Okay, the Justice Academy uh, sessions will be those that are not repeated on a regular basis. Um, it's, you know, it's, again, it's, it's information on current public safety and justice inquiries. Some of the topics uh, that are presented this time around are those that were requested from last year, from, during the evaluation period. For example, uh, the, the session that you're going to have tonight, critical need for witness support in prosecution, is a current issue. You've seen on the news and in the paper where there is a serious concern with people um, not coming forward uh, during serious crimes, uh, people not reporting or being a part of the process. We've heard over and over this summer the same, kind of the same theme when I think about tonight's session. And, and I've heard it and some of our staff that have been attending the community conversations all summer you know, after a homicide, you've heard where they've had those community conversations. And some of you may have attended some of those. But we have seen, we've heard a trend in statement, and that is there were 50 witnesses, but no one saw anything. And so that's why the topic that we have tonight is so relevant. Uh, before the sessions begin, uh, pull, if you open your folder and pull this, pull this out, The other three sessions, criminals targeting the baby boomer generation, we've heard some, some continued conversation on our adult and senior residents being victims of fraud. That was one that was on our evaluations from last year, and then because of what was going on in the news, we decided to add that to our sessions this year. Deadly myths about domestic and dating violence, that one is unfortunately a continued one uh, that we're hearing about and that is just, um, just something that we felt we wanted to make sure we covered uh, during the, the CJA this year. The last one, overcoming the barriers of re-entry, that's another topic we keep hearing about. The, one of the things the, prosec what the prosecutor's office is trying to do is making sure you know, with our community prosecution staff and other staff, that we are keeping our eyes and our ears open to what's happening in our county when we make the decisions to provide programs like this. Okay. How many of you attended the Community Justice Academy prior to tonight? Show of hands. Okay. Welcome back, all of those that had attended before. And to all the new people that are here with us tonight, welcome. Uh, we're glad that you could make it. Um, just again, just special thanks to our community prosecution and communication staff. And now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Deputy Prosecuting Attorney Nikina Kane, who will introduce our speakers for tonight. And also, tonight and the last night takes a little longer just because of some of the preliminary and then at the end, um, some additional things going on, so just uh, uh, bear with us. We just started a little bit late today, but I, um, I'm excited.
to get started. We don't deliver babies. <laughs> <laughs> She's excited to see what happens tonight, so she'll stay in there. Hello, everyone. I'm Nikina Kane. I'm a deputy prosecutor of Marion County's office, and this is Kennedy. <laughs> Welcome and thank you for joining us for uh, the Community Justice Academy for 2014. Tonight I will serve as your room assistant. Um, you will hear from three very dynamic presenters and there will be a Q&A session following. Uh, we will have break at about 7.20, 7.30. Um, when you see me stand up or I'll approach the podium, that's when we will go into break. The restrooms are located through the double doors. Just keep straight, you can't miss it. Um, there's water fountains in between the two restrooms. During the break, I will announce two of seven fabulous door prizes. The remaining five door prizes I will reserve for the end of the evening. Now I will take this opportunity to introduce tonight's speakers. After introductions, the next voices you'll hear will be from tonight's presenters. first presenter I'll introduce is Prosecutor Terry Curry. Terry Curry was elected Marion County Prosecutor in 2010. He has practiced law for more than 30 years in Marion County, including serving for six years as a Deputy Prosecutor handling white collar crimes. He leads an office of 400 staff members, including 180 Deputy Prosecutors, who disposed of more than 50,000 criminal cases last year. The office also provides crime prevention workshops and facilitates child support collection for Marion County families. His administration has focused on enhancing the community's role in public safety and creating safer neighborhoods through crime prevention. Since taking office, he's also dedicated more resources to prosecuting gangs, gun violence, and white collar crimes. His office is currently prosecuting numerous homicide cases, including the defendants in the Richmond Hill explosion, the quadruple homicide on the southeast side of Marion County, and the unfortunate killing of IMPD Officer Perry Wren. Our next presenter is Dr. Natalie Hippel, PhD. Dr. Hippel is an assistant professor at the Department of Criminal Justice at Indiana University. Dr. Hippel's research interests include gun violence, crime and disorders surrounding drug markets, evaluation of criminal justice programs, environmental crimes, crime analysis, restorative justice, and attitudes toward crime and justice. Prior to coming to Indiana University, she was an assistant research professor and coordinator of online programs at Michigan State University's Criminal Justice Department. She has served as the co-principal investigator for the Drug Market Intervention and Project Safe Neighborhoods Training and Technical Assistance Programs. Dr. Hippel is co-principal investigator for the National Institute of Justice Project, examining non-fatal shooting across, mid, about, across four Midwestern cities. She is also working with colleagues to develop a violence reduction assessment tool. This tool is designed to assist communities assess their capacity to implement evidence-based crime prevention and control strategies, as well as training community teams and research partnerships using the action research model. Dr. Hippel has published numerous articles and reports, most recently appearing in Criminology and Public Policy, Crime and Delinquency, Journal of Experimental Criminology, and the Journal of Quantitative Criminology. She recently co-edited a book titled The New Criminal Justice, American Communities and the Changing, the Changing World of Criminal Justice. She earned her doctorate in criminal justice from Indiana University. And the final speaker that I'll introduce is Deborah Ann Watson. Ms. Watson was born and raised in Indianapolis and grew up on the city's west side. She attended Northwest High School and IUPUI. For 26 years, Deborah worked at St. Vincent's Hospital and is currently serving as the manager in the dietary department. Deborah is a mother of two sons, Justin and Thomas Keyes. On November 15, 2012, 
Deborah's son, Thomas, was tragically murdered. This unfortunate event allowed Deborah to see the value in the life of other youth. And now she heads a non-for-profit organization, the Thomas Garrett Keyes Foundation. This foundation was named after her son, Thomas DJ Keyes. And the main focus is to strengthen and expand the lives of youth through games, education, mental support, and regaining family structure. It is Deborah's faith in God that encouraged her to have the desire to help others. Those are our three speakers for the evening. So now we can begin. Thank you, Nikina. If you've been around our office uh, much uh, recently, uh, you would conclude that we actually need a physician on staff. We've had so many uh, births in our office. So, and Nikina obviously appears to be next in line. Uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you so much for being here. The fact that you're here means that you care about our city, you care about public safety issues, uh, and that's precisely why we have these programs each year. Uh, this, as you know, is the fourth year we've done this, uh, and uh, I see so many familiar faces that I feel like some of you are now working on your uh, CJA PhDs uh, here soon. Um, and it, I, I've said it a couple of times as, as the press has talked to me about why we do this, and, and it sounds like a cliche, uh, but I have said knowledge is power. Uh, and I think that, that as, as we share information, uh, things that are of interest uh, and things that can assist all of us in perhaps addressing public safety issues, uh, that we will accomplish something uh, this month as I feel we have done in the last three years. Um, and but just so I don't forget, I absolutely want to extend our appreciation to Deborah Watson uh, for being here tonight and, and sharing her story with you as well. Uh, so what we're going to talk about, obviously, is the critical need for witness support and prosecution. Uh, Dr. Hipple has actually been working with our office and, uh, and uh, the police agencies here in the city on a particular program that I'm going to let her talk about a little bit uh, here in a minute. But clearly, uh, our reality is that we frequently run into issues uh, where uh, witnesses decline to cooperate, victims decline to cooperate, and so it is a challenge we face uh, virtually every single day as, as to how do we uh, assure individuals that, that they should participate with the police, they should cooperate uh, with us in prosecuting individuals who have committed crime. Okay, AJ, where are we? There we go. We'll talk about this case because I think it's a perfect case study uh, of uh, exactly the issues that we talk about uh, and, and, and the things that we've encountered. And, and this uh, is a case that arises from uh, a, a homicide that occurred on July 4th um, in 2013. Um, there was big crowds downtown, of course, for July 4th for the fireworks. Uh, and. Uh, an individual by the name of Monkeys Edwards was shot and killed on that evening. Um, Aaron Bonner was charged with that case, and I will say at the outset and repeat again at the end, Aaron Bonner has never been convicted of any crime. Uh, he was charged uh, at one point uh, uh, with uh, the killing of uh, Mr. Edwards. Uh, but but the, I want to talk about sort of the circumstances of that night and, and, and what has occurred from that night forward. As uh, you might guess, and it was clearly the case, there were huge crowds of people downtown. And as you probably all know, uh, there are surveillance cameras uh, downtown as well uh, in various locations that, that can then be um, retrieved uh, if incidents occur to see what is shown on those, uh, those cameras. And on that particular night, um, there were, uh, when Mr. Edwards was shot, uh, there was a crowd of people gathered around, uh, and fortunately, the, where the incident actually occurred on the camera angle was obscured by a street light. So it was impossible to, to know exactly from the surveillance video what had occurred uh, at that time. Uh, but at some point, uh, gunshots were fired, and, and literally, they estimate from the video, as many as 100 people in the immediate area ran away. As, as we would all do uh, if we heard gunshots. Uh, after that occurred, 
uh, when the police first then responded to the scene and, and uh, talked to the press, they encouraged anyone who had observed anything to please come forward and share what they had seen uh, at that location. Not a single person, not a single person came forward in response to that request. From that point, then, the police were able to identify uh, enough uh, clarity uh, in the video to put out some images of individuals and say, if you know this, if you are this individual, you know this individual, we would like to speak to you because we have identified this individual as being near that scene. Um, at that point, because a number of the individuals who were there were juveniles, uh, their parents start bringing them in. And so there were some uh, uh, young people who were brought in uh, by their parents to be interviewed by the police as if they had seen anything. Ultimately, when those individuals were interviewed, every single person interviewed, other than one, said they didn't see anything. In spite of the fact that clearly some were close enough where they would had to have seen something. But their response to being interviewed was, I didn't see anything. One individual uh, did ultimately give a statement uh, implicating Mr. Bonner. He was 16 years old, and I'll come back to him in a second. Uh, as, as we again identified other individuals, and again, not, I'm not uh, tending to criticize anyone, but uh, these are the sort of circumstances that are, we encounter virtually every day. Another individual was um, identified who was present at the scene, and when our deputy prosecutor and the investigating detective went to the home uh, of the grandmother where the, the son was left, the grandmother yelled and screamed uh, at, at our deputy prosecutor uh, and the detective saying her grandson hadn't seen anything and didn't want us interviewing him. Uh, the, that particular individual had a cousin who was also identified uh, as probably being uh, near the scene and multiple attempts to locate that individual, ultimately never even uh, uh, located that individual. Going back to the one individual who, who gave a statement that implicated Mr. Bonner, uh, when he was then finally uh, deposed by the defendant, um, said initially in his deposition, I didn't say that, uh, and when shown that he in fact had said it, um, then said, well, uh, I just said that because I thought that's what the police wanted me to say. All of that, of course, led to the circumstances then uh, in September, uh, uh, this past month, where the pending case was dismissed. Again, this is, I, I share all of this because uh, I feel it's a case study uh, of the reality that our police agencies deal with and we deal with, uh, and is obviously the subject we want to talk about today, and that is, how do we overcome the hesitancy, the reluctance uh, of individuals to participate, to come forward, and to cooperate in criminal investigations? Well, we're going to jump now to some statistics uh, as well, uh, and, and which again, I think illustrate uh, some of the issues we face. Um, and the statistics grow out of uh, a program that we've been involved in for at least two years now that Dr. Hippel has actually headed. Uh, called the Non-Fatal Shooting Review Team. And, and I'm, I will let uh, Dr. Hippel explain in a little more detail what that is and then go through the statistics that we're going to share with you. Uh, but in a nutshell, uh, it is a, a, a task force involving virtually several, uh, every single public safety agency here in town. Our office is involved, uh, police agencies, probation, community corrections, uh, and uh, as Dr. Hibble will explain, the point is to examine non-fatal shootings in more detail to see if we can identify patterns, identify uh, recurring individuals, and take uh, preventative steps to prevent uh, violence going forward. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Natalie Hipple, and I wanted to thank Prosecutor Curry and Annie for letting me be here today and talk about a little bit about our non-fatal shooting review board and how it ties into the issue of victim and witness cooperation. Uh, the Non-Fatal Shooting Review Board was founded in late 2002, and really the difference between, if you don't know, and you probably do just based on hearing everybody's introductions, most of the homicides committed in Marion County are committed with firearm. So the only difference between a firearm and a non-fatal shooting is either poor aim or good medicine. 
So if you look right here, you can see that we have we have a person shot every day in this in, in Marion County in Indianapolis. Somebody gets shot every day. This year we're on a record rate for homicides. People are dying at a higher rate this year than they've been dying at other rates due to due to gunshots. But we decided that um, this was an under this was an issue that really needed to be paid attention to, and they're looking at it at other cities like Milwaukee, Detroit, and St. Louis. So. Uh, Prosecutor Curry stated that we have a multi-agency working group. We, we have a group that meets every month to review very specific non-fatal shootings. And what we've discovered, and I'm going to show you just two, two slides of data, is really that um, our victims look a lot like our suspects, and we're seeing the same people at different events. So they might be someone that's involved in a shooting or a homicide, meaning that maybe they drove their friend to the hospital, dropped them off, and drove off. And then we might see them later at another shooting where they're either a witness or perhaps uh, a suspect. And then, unfortunately, we see the pattern where the, they may become the victim, either of a shooting or a homicide. So we created this board that has four goals. One is to prevent, make, prevent future shootings. That's the first goal. The second goal is to collect accurate information on non-fatal shootings. Our record management systems here in Marion County don't provide rec uh, numbers on shootings. You just can't go into the record management system, the police or the prosecutors or anybody's system by nobody's fault of their own and pull out shootings. Those numbers don't exist. So we're manually counting every single shooting that happens in Marion County. The third goal is to uh, uh, encourage information sh sharing. We have, as you mentioned, federal pro probation comes to our meetings, the prosecutor's office, the sheriff's office, many different uh, aspects of Indianapolis Metro Metropolitan Police Department come to our meetings prosecutor's office, all the community prosecutors are there. We have probation and parole, we have nuisance abatement, we have city legal, um, the fusion center comes. Uh, a huge, huge buy-in to these meetings to talk about these shootings and, and dissect them and look for our fourth, which is our fourth goal, putting forth actionable recommendations. Some of the recommendations can be system fixes within either an agency, like we might recognize that something isn't quite working the way it should with dispatch or with the prosecutor's office or we often question why um, cases are being dismissed, even, and or why they're being prosecuted, or what you know. We get information from the prosecutor's office to share with other people at the table. Same with the police department. How did this case? How did this case evolve? What are we doing? What are we doing with this case? Um, other recommendations can be higher level, and we'll talk about uh, that a little bit later. Such as we really need more investment in a victim witness protection program here in Marion County. And that's a recommendation that's come from our group. That's a recommendation that the prosecutor's office acknowledges, but there's funding issues with that, and, and I'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So I just wanted to go, talk about and how this ties in. So you're thinking, how does this tie in? The prosecutor, prosecutor Curry just talked about a case where we really had, well, what we can't consider it an uncooperative victim because unfortunately the young man died. But we had uncooperative witnesses in that case. Hundreds of people were there, and no one came forward to, to say what they saw. So when we're discussing these cases, we've come up, um, we've recognized this pattern in the non-fatal shooting cases as well. We're labeling them uncooperative victims or uncooperative incidents, where it may be the same type of thing. The camera angle was bad or there's no camera. Um, they, uh, witnesses didn't see anything, didn't hear anything. We have a saying where we call it, heard shot, felt pain. Some of our victims were walking down the street, they heard a shot, they felt pain. They don't know who shot them. There's no crime scene to be found. They showed up at the hospital, and the only reason law enforcement knows about it is because the hospital is required by law to call them. So these are folks that, if they didn't really felt feel like they needed medical attention, would be brought to nobody would know that they were even shot. And so, what does that mean? What What are they doing? Are they just not saying anything, and they don't want to get involved in the justice system? Are they scared? Is it a snitching culture? Were they involved in the crime themselves when they were happened to be shot? Um, and these are all issues that affect everyone in the community, again, because we see these patterns of people um, across shootings, and also affects the prosecution, which shows up in the case that you were just talking about, that Prosecutor Curry just talked about, and then affects everyone's safety and community safety, and, and prevents us from preventing future shootings. So if you look at these numbers um, from 2012 and 2013, we're running oh, right around 40%, a little over 40% of these cases, of these 400 shootings that happen every year, about half of them we have uncooperative victims. So what are the police to do if they can't bring a case forward, or if they do bring a case forward, what's the prosecutor's office to do, to do if a witness recants or just refuses to testify? And um, 
These are just statistics about the criminal histories. So what I should mention is that this issue, this non-fatal shooting issue, has been brought to the attention of the Department of Justice. The United States government is, is, is interested in this issue. We've received, Michigan State received a grant through the National Institute of Justice, which is the research arm of the Department of Justice, to study non-fatal shootings in Detroit, Indianapolis, Milwaukee, and now we're expanding into St. Louis beginning in 2015. This is really important, and people care about this at the high government level. And so they're, they're enabling us to look at some of these issues that we wouldn't be able to look, look at as researchers, which would in turn would help hopefully inform policy and inform the police department and the prosecutor's office. So the, these, I won't, you know, I could go on and on and on, and I can't deliver babies despite the fact that I'm a doctor, <laughs> on statistics and keep talking because that's the, the college professor in me. But really what we want to show here is at these shootings, and th this I think is tied into the uncooperativeness of these cases, is that the suspects look a lot like the victims. And this isn't victim blaming in any way, shape, or form. This is just the way it is. And so the way, the fact that we're seeing these folks show up as victims, as suspects, as uh, uh, people that are involved, uh, people that are um, homeowners. We, we're looking when we review these cases. We look at who actually owns the home, if they're renters, if they're if they're um, actually own the house that they live in. We're seeing these these kind of repeat offenders, or we, we call them our the term we like to use for them is alumni. They're alumni of our non-fatal shooting meetings. That's not a good thing to be alumni of our, our non-fatal shooting. So here, and I'll just flip back and forth. The numbers are pretty similar. You have the slides, I think, so there's, there's no reason for me to read them all to you. And I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. And actually, uh, I think what uh, I'm going to do is uh, suggest that this, for, it's a little earlier than you've suggested, but it's perhaps a good time to take a break because we'll come back and talk about the solutions. But again, I mean, to me, and, and obviously, we live with these statistics every day, uh, but even though I know it and we live it, it is incredible to me that almost half the people who have been shot uh, then decline to cooperate with a police investigator. And we're not talking about a petty crime, we're talking about someone who's been shot and as Dr. Hipple said, because of bad aim or, or because of good medicine has avoided becoming yet another murder statistic. But when the police respond to those scenes, um, decline to participate. And so again, just like the July 4th, it illustrates the magnitude of the problem. Um, and I think at this point, what we'd like to do is take a break. We're going to come back and talk about some of the things uh, that we can do, hear from Deborah. And then I think the most productive thing we can do is, is to hear from you and, and to talk about uh, your thoughts as well. What we're going to do is talk a little bit about uh, some things that are available, and, and then I, I think uh, at the end kind of go into I think what's going to be a little broader discussion about uh, um, addressing public safety issues uh, within the city. Uh, it impacts uh, all of public safety, and just not the idea that, that we need victims and witnesses to cooperate. Um, Dr. Hippel alluded to victim witness assistance, and uh, uh, we have within our office uh, victim advocates, an uh, entire group who do a phenomenal job. Um, I know Deborah uh, interacted with our, uh, it was, who was your victim? Vanita. Vanita. Vanita Farrow, who's been there in our office forever, was a uh, uh, victim advocate assisting Deborah, and, and they do a great job. But, but uh, again, it's like anything else, uh, we're limited in our resources, uh, and uh, we wish we could expand upon that concept to have more individuals who could do outreach in terms of assisting uh, victims and witnesses uh, in, in our cases. Um, but uh, our deputy prosecutors, uh, the investigating police officers, uh, as well as our victim advocates, um, we in the first instance do everything we can to convince individuals who have found themselves involved in the criminal justice system uh, to cooperate with us, to emphasize how important it is that they share with us what it is they've known, what it is they've seen, uh, and, and in many, many instances uh, that is all that's required and, and that uh, clearly there are uh, the vast majority of people in our community who want to do the right thing and do that every single day and allow us to go forward in trials and successfully prosecute individuals who have committed crimes. Uh, Demar Department of Metropolitan Development maintains a list of affordable properties and facilitates relationships between landlords and those 
who need relocation. So again, we can work with the Department of Metropolitan Development and identify uh, some facilities where uh, we could get individuals, uh, if they need assistance, getting housing, getting settled, so that they're not in an unsettled position and, and vulnerable to intimidation and being uh, uh, scared into not cooperating. Uh, if I might. Sure. The, the research just shows that really, I mean, this isn't like television witness, victim witness relocation where you get a new name and a new identity and you move to Arizona. I mean, the research shows if you can just remove these people to the other side of the city, if you can give them a sense of safety away from that area, uh, these, net, these shootings tend to happen in kind of networks of people, so if you can remove them out of that network of people and just get them, like I said, to a different area of the city, that actually can be really um, beneficial to everyone involved. Right, and, and uh, we have sort of comparable uh, resources available uh, to our office, uh, just like Department of Met Metropolitan Development. It is, and I will emphasize limited, uh, but exactly that sort of thing. And it's a drastic measure. Uh, of course, to, to uproot someone, and, and clearly we're not going to force someone to do that. But we have had circumstances where, in particular, uh, if it's a, a juvenile who's a witness and is being intimidated at school and otherwise is in an uncomfortable situation where the parents have, have said, yes, uh, you know, we'll take advantage of this and move to a, another uh, township uh, here in Marion County and get a new start and also then feel uh, free to cooperate uh, with whatever the pending investigation is. And when I say limited, I really mean limited. Michelle, uh, in this calendar year, how soon was it we, we exhausted those, those funds? We were able to help four families. Four families, and by early in the year, those funds were exhausted. Again, that was by way of a grant. Uh, and again, it's just a, it's, it's a never-ending problem for government services in general and, and for us in terms of finding funding uh, for these sort of services. Uh, I'm going to defer back to Dr. Hippel uh, and to share her thoughts in terms of, of what she's observed, her experience, her research in terms of obtaining cooperation. Then I want to talk about a broader subject, building bridges of trust, uh, and then uh, turn it over to Deborah for her uh, observations as well. Well, the research on the victimology research, as it's called, is really limited. And the, when we started working on this project, we were trying to figure out what was out there to actually refer to. And the first set of literature you come upon is this victim blaming literature, which you may be familiar with. It happens a lot in rape cases, where she was dressed too provocatively, she drank too much, you know, they, it, she put herself in the position to be raped, or or victims put themselves in a position to be victimized. And there is some kind of, um, you know, things you can do to prevent yourself from becoming a victim as well. But again, the victim blaming literature is the first set of literature we came across. And that really isn't that satisfactory to me as a researcher. And so, um, as I mentioned, we have a grant from the National Institute of Justice, and we're looking specifically interested in this uncooperative um, um, phenomenon, really, and what it is we can do policy-wise, and how that affects the police department specifically and the prosecutor's office specifically. So the questions arise like, um, how much time and energy should the police put into a case where they absolutely refuse to cooperate? Where they didn't want to call the police, they showed up at the emergency room because their friend drove them, and the only reason they know about it is because the, by law the emergency room had to call. So we don't really know, and that it's exploratory. Um, the prosecutor's office is um, helping. I applied for another grant at Indiana University to actually interview some of these uncooperative victims. And you might say, well, why would they talk to me if they're not going to talk to the police or um, prosecutor's office? Uh, there's actually a lot of uh, self-report data, as it's called. People like to talk. And so I think if we give them enough incentive and we can ask the right questions, that's what we're planning to do to kind of get at this, to see um, what it is we can do differently. What is it? Is it trust of the, <coughs> it leads into the next discussion, trust? of the police? Is it trust of your neighbors? Is it trust of the prosecutor's office? Like, what is this? What do we need to do to build this back up to be able to create a safer city? Because the evidence is there that these these networks will continue. The, the you know the um, alumni of our non-fatal shootings are going to continue to circulate, and unfortunately, some of them will be homicide victims eventually. So. And uh, one other point I would like to make, and, and uh, perhaps I should have made this at the outset, you know, from our perspective as the prosecutor's office, um, 
when we have a situation where, where a witness will not cooperate or, or many times a victim will not cooperate, um, we don't just automatically give up. Uh, we make every effort to go forward on cases to, to find other ways, to find appropriate circumstantial evidence if necessary, uh, to, to go forward uh, and make every single effort we can to prosecute a case. Uh, we, uh, it's an unfortunate reality, for example, in the area of domestic violence uh, that the victims will uh, frequently recant, um, even though it's abundantly clear that the crime had occurred. Uh, and we have had some success in obtaining uh, prosecu uh, uh, convictions uh, in domestic violence cases uh, where uh, the victims uh, literally uh, did not show up for trial. Uh, by putting together circumstantial evidence and other um, uh, medical records sort of evidence uh, and obtain a conviction. And so uh, we do make that effort, but sometimes the, the obstacles that are created are insurmountable and, and lead either to uh, lack of a conviction or a not guilty verdict or, or in instances like the first one where we ultimately feel we have no choice but to dismiss the case. And, but this last subject I put up here, Building Bridge of Trust, uh, is something that's uh, occurred to me um, just in the last uh, month or so. And, and it, it arose uh, when questions by the press uh, were asked of us and asked of me personally about the July 4th shooting uh, and, and the problems that are created when witnesses uh, refuse to cooperate. And, and I realized in the first instance I was sort of talking about it as if it, it were all one situation, when in fact there are nuances uh, to the circumstances where a victim might not cooperate or, or a witness and, and sort of in a broad category uh, it occurred to me that on the one hand uh, we have the circumstance where there are clearly individuals who uh, follow the code of silence uh, and the street code of silence and no snitching uh, and, and that is sort of part of their day-to-day -day life uh, and, and what they have uh, learned uh, from the street. And uh, those two tie into the vigilante justice where you're going to see them again. They'll take care of this themselves. Right. The alumni. Yep. The alumni. But, but it, it also occurred to me that, 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 that there's a, a second very distinct category, and that is that are individuals who clearly would like to do the right thing, but are intimidated, they're concerned, they're frightened, to come forward because the fear of what is going to happen uh, in their neighborhood. Um, and it has occurred to me that we collectively have failed individuals who live in, in, those, in those neighborhoods. Uh, because clearly, uh, if an individual is of that mindset, then they've lost faith in the ability of government to serve them. Uh, and so as a consequence, uh, you know, I, the message that I, I've sent in the last couple of weeks and, and the message I want to talk about tonight is that, that we need to make certain that all services are available to these neighborhoods where that has occurred. And it's just not that the police are present, it's not just that the prosecutor's office is present, but all governmental services are there and available to support that neighborhood. And to be there as part of the effort is the thing Mr. Callahan said, to make sure that he's going to reclaim his neighborhood and not let his neighborhood uh, be in that situation. And so clearly, and, and fortunately, Director Riggs has, has been talking about that. If you, I'm sure most of you know who I'm referring to. Director Troy Riggs is the Director of Public Safety. Uh, and uh, they are in the process of rolling out statistics that we've talked about for some time. And not just look at what crime occurred in any given neighborhood, but what's the percentage of abandoned housing in that neighborhood? Uh, what is the uh, relatively health level in that neighborhood? What's the income level? What's the education level? And see what factors are there, and that then we can collectively start to address those. And so as a consequence, as I said, I think, uh, who was at uh, the church on Friday night? I heard someone say and it's said on Friday night, what we need to do is to make sure we're kicking butt of code enforcement, zoning, Marion County Health Department, Anthony, to make sure that we are working as a collective effort to address those issues in those neighborhoods, to reclaim the faith 
of those who otherwise would be disinclined to cooperate with us. And so how the neighborhoods fit into that, of course, is, is obvious. And many of you, uh, I know already from uh, talking with you and seeing you before, you're already engaged in exactly what I'm going to say, which is the neighborhoods also have to do their parts. Uh, we have to have neighbors who are nosy neighbors, as you would hear in a burglary presentation. Uh, we need to implement crime watch clubs if you don't yet have one uh, on your block. Uh, and, and by doing those things, we reclaim those neighborhoods and start to address the sort of systemic problems that are there that will allow everyone to come forward uh, and, and share in the revitalization of the neighborhoods. And it is, in fact, entirely possible because there are pockets all over Marion County where that's exactly what's being done and where uh, the neighbors have said, we will not put up with crime. And of course that facilitates exactly what we're talking about here is because they know that we're working together in a unified way uh, to make sure that the burglar who has committed the crime or any sort of crime that's been committed in your neighborhood is going to be prosecuted to the fullest extent. The Pats, uh, how many times do you show up to courts to be an advocate on behalf of uh, the state uh, against those who have committed crimes in your neighborhoods? Mm -hmm. These two ladies. And the, and the evidence, yeah. too, shows mm -hmm. that the police and the prosecutor can't do it alone. And that the, the there, and I, I mean, I'm the data geek, and I'm not, you know, embarrassed to own that. But that's what the, the data are showing: that the, in order to have sustainable crime reduction, the community is a key piece. The community, and however you see it, whether it's the neighbors, whether it's the church, whether it's the neighborhood group, the crime watch group, or the collective efficacy of everyone. If the community piece isn't there, the drop is only temporary, and then it creeps back up. And and. I guess I would just add as well is, is, is you know it's easy for me to say that it's easy for me to say you know we need to have uh, code enforcement there but that's exactly what has to happen and so uh, I, I'm I have no problem uh, being an advocate but all of us you know, need to make sure that you are a loud voice in, in addressing those agencies as well we will be there. Uh, and we need uh, the collective effort of all the governmental services to reclaim our neighborhoods. I, I started to ask a question. Why don't you hold your question, and, and I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Deborah Watson, and uh, then uh, we will uh, have a discussion. Hello, my name is Deborah Watson, as you know. Uh, my son was a victim of violence on November. 15th, 2012. Uh, his name was Thomas G. Keys, Thomas Garrett Keys, which was uh, known as DJ Keys. Yeah. Uh, I would watch the Law and Order, and I would see, you know, all the incidents on there, crimes on there, and I would, never would have thought it would happen to to me and my son. Uh, I watched that. Uh, what will happen to my lovable son. He was uh, lovable. He said, don't meet a stranger. Uh, just a wonderful guy. Uh, the first thing I, I think, I'm sorry, real quiet, be nervous for a minute, but I'll calm down in a minute. <laughs> in the beginning, I didn't think who did it. I was work I was just thinking, why, you know? Why would, why would someone do this to my baby, you know? Um, about four days later, I received a call from Dr. Uh, Detective Sheminar who was the detective on the case. He called me, he introduced himself to me, said he was gonna work hard to find out who had done this to my son. Um, and after that, every time he would lock someone up, uh, he would call me and let me know that uh, uh, we got him and we gonna keep finding, you know, keep on until we find everyone. One day he had called and he said, you know, your son must have been loved, he said, cause so many people, they got so many calls about uh, the, the, the criminals' whereabouts and where they were. So he said, but and that's why they were able to catch him so fast. And I was so thankful for that. And the, the community took action, you know, for my son. The next call came from the prosecutor's office, and they wanted to uh, set up meetings uh, for us to meet the prosecutor and to also tell us about the pretrials, for us to start going to the trials. Uh, and when we went to the meeting, it was so uplifting because the, the, the uh, deputy prosecutors were so confident 
and caring at the same time. They wanted to put those, those guys away just like we did for their wrongdoing. I met my victim advocate who helped me through the process, and she was wonderful, you know. Uh, anytime I needed you know, someone to talk to, uh, she was there, you know, she would call me back. And uh, through this process, we really need that help. Uh, later I found out that one of the guys charged in the case had just beat a murder case. And I thought to myself, I said, now, if the cause of witness didn't come and testify against him. And I thought, I said, well, if that person had testified against that guy, maybe my baby would still be alive. And I went to all the pre-trials and, and, uh, and they ended up being four trials. <coughs> And each witness, uh, there was like four to five witnesses at every trial. Um, at all four trials, and every time they always showed back up. And I thank them for that. And with all this working together, we received justice. 728 years among the, all the six guys. We have started a foundation in my son's name. And his name is Thomas Derek Keys. And his initials, in the initials is TGK. And it's touching, given knowledge to help build a future for our children. And I want to say thank you to all involved in our victory. <coughs> Detective Shimonar, Prosecutor Ross Anderson, Jeremy Tipton, the paralegal Miguel, the victim advocate Vernita, Judge Borges, and witnesses and jurors. Because uh, it was something, I take my hats off to them because this, they see this stuff every day. And I just went through those four trials. And I didn't know what I was going to do or how I was even going to make it afterwards. And they do go through it every day to try to get victory and justice for every family that goes through this. And I just want to take my hat off to them and I thank them. Thank you. As Deborah indicated, um, uh, there were six individuals charged uh, with uh, the murder of her son. All six uh, were convicted, and, and uh, there were some witnesses who were uh, reluctant, uh, but ultimately uh, we had sufficient evidence to convict all six of those individuals. Uh, with that, um, sir, I think you had a question. Oh, me. <laughs> or an observation. And then it doesn't have to be questions. Uh, this is just open it up to you. I've, I've just I've been helping people like I said for quite a while, and one of the things that I've noticed, especially going in doing research, is most organizations or most communities seem to think that the government is the is the solution to everything. And I'm not one that thinks the government is the solution to squat. And I, from my point of view, the families the faith-based, the communities, the business community have lost control of their neighborhoods and they're dumping on the government to pull their ass out of a, a sling. And I think we're going to keep remaining in this situation until the families and the faith-based community and the business community start taking their own responsibility for their own family and their own neighborhoods instead of waiting for somebody else to help clean up their messes. And then clearly, uh, we all have to take ownership uh, of, of, uh, of our city. Uh, and, and I think uh, um, that is a, certainly, I, I realize I start to sound like a broken record. Uh, Director Riggs as well, Chief Height uh, as well. Uh, and uh, um, you know, I, I think on the one hand, certainly there's individual responsibility for these things. But on the other hand, you know, we all have to take responsibility. I, I had occasion to say, I think I said it Friday night at the church, you know, the, the Chamber of Commerce needs to realize that, that they should care about what happens in Hallville and what happens in Forest Manor. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, it's easy for me to be the messenger, uh, but I think all of us together uh, can send the message and, and motivate that sort of action that's required. Um, you know, I, I alluded to abandoned housing. Abandoned housing is a horrible, horrible problem. Uh, and, and until we find a way to address it, uh, it will continue to, to uh, cause the, the deterioration in neighborhoods, in turn, you know, the crime. I mean, the pattern is, is very predictable, I'm sure. Uh, Dr. Hipple could, could expound upon that as well. Uh, but uh, 
you know, I, I, I agree with you. And, uh, <coughs> ma'am, I'll say uh, your hand up. Yes. Uh, do you think that some of the suspects are coming? We used to hear quite a bit about Chicago, uh, the killing fields <coughs> up there. And then I'm noticing that we're seeing more and more Chicago plates, Illinois plates in Indianapolis as well. So do you think that they're coming from up there to here to get away from, um, you know, being caught in, in, in that area? I would say the non-fatal shootings are our suspects are local. The problem being, though, that we probably only have suspects in 50% of the cases, maybe less than that, 25% of the cases that we have a named suspect. Okay. But there, most of them have local addresses. And, and I think there's, there's some of that. Certainly in the area, the obvious area of, of drug trafficking, there's wow. always going to be this competition as to you know, whether folks are coming in from Lake County or they're coming from Chicago, are they local, you know, who's driving out who, and clearly some, that contributes to some of the violence. Uh, but, but you know, for the most part, uh, I, I certain Dr. Hipple's right. Most of it is is homegrown. Let's start over here, Miss Pat. Um, we we have a saying in our neighborhood that if you can't get through, please call me. Um, I pick up the phone and I call. I give them all the information that the neighbors give me. Um, I let them know that they can come to my house and talk to me. We've had neighborhood watches with the police where the whole team on the east side has come over and had roll call. It's wonderful. My people get to meet the police, get to talk to the police, get to understand the police. They're good people. They're good people. They're working their, I can't say that word. They're working their self crazy trying to get us cleaned up. The east side, I've been there 75 years. They're not gonna move me out. They're going to have to carry me out. They're going to have to carry me out. But if you, you get sick, I had a whole neighborhood show up because I got sick. I, you know, Patsy Boyce and uh, uh, Reem, Margaret Reem, went down every day to the court appearance. Who was that guy? Oh, the mur murder on uh, Jefferson Avenue. The murder on Jefferson Street? Mm -hmm. They never left. They never left that courtroom until he was sentenced. And then the state patrol walked him across the street to their car. We are committed to make sure there's only four of us in this city. There's only four of us. We are committed to make sure that these people are put behind bars and left there where they belong. Now, the one question I have is, and I can't figure this out for the life of me, we get these guys in there, they've had gun prosecution before. They were let off, or they were given a deal, or they were done something to. So they get back in there for another killing, and they're again made a deal. Why can't we give them a deal of 170 years? <laughs> Why do we have to mess around and give them 30 years with the chance of probation? Do we need to get rid of the judges? If we do, tell us. I'll be more than happy to go down and start talking against the judges. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a little difficult to generalize about any given case. Certainly, uh, the six individuals who were uh, sentenced in um, Deborah's son's murder uh, got the sort of deal that, that you described in terms of sentences. You know, it's, it's, it, it's really impossible to generalize in terms of any given single case, uh, but you know, clearly, and you know, I'm not defending the judges or, or, or saying anything against them, you know, but from our perspective as a prosecutor in the courts, we prosecute individuals within the parameters of whatever law applies and uh, as part of that there's a sentence that applies and the judges sentence individuals within the context of, of those sentencing. But you touched upon something that I think makes a good point and something we can't solve here tonight but it ties into exactly what we're talking about and that is the police and, and your relationship with them and, and the, the community role that they have. Uh, I think clearly Chief Height and Director Riggs would be 100% on board with the model of a community policing approach. Um, 
And, you know, but uh, the problem we have right now is the staffing levels are such that, that it's really impossible to implement a full community pl policing model. Um, Maybe tired of hearing you call. Pardon? Maybe tired of hearing you call because I want another meeting. I want another meeting in another location. Mm -hmm. I've been a church that has, has fought so badly because we had a killing at Denny and New York. Young, young boy killed in front of God and everybody in front of his parents, in front of his grandparents. It was terrible. He went out and called DPL. DPL came out and put one of those blinder night lights up. It cost $20 a month. And he said, the church will pay for it. It goes north, south, east, and west. Mm -hmm. That whole area is lit up like a neon light. It's wonderful. Right. Right, and, but again, the idea of community policing is just you know, that the, they have the ability to, to essentially get out of their cars and establish those relationships so that you know your patrol officer, they know you, uh, and not to bore you with war stories, but I did a ride along about a year, year ago with East District, uh, they were patrolling the area at 42nd Post. They, they were so understaffed uh, that when officers in uh, district or a zone on the Near East side responded to shooting, then those officers from 42nd and Post had, had to respond to a run to Near East Side downtown. So I was riding with my officer at 100 miles an hour down 70 to respond from 42nd and Post to a few blocks from downtown. So when you've got that sort of understaffing in your police department, it's virtually impossible to have a community policing model. But if we had that, if we get to that point, and clearly that conversation is going on, that again is another step in the right direction in terms of building that trust uh, in our individual neighborhoods. Mr. Callahan. Yes, well, um, there's two things I want to talk about, uh, say. But one is if we become in our communities more eyes and ears for the police department, we will help relieve that understaffing to some degree. If we're willing to call in and report in and stay on that line until the officer gets there, and if we're willing to back that officer up in the courtroom and come down and, 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 and speak and be out in front, uh, then, uh, then we're going to help to relieve that issue. To a certain extent, we've got to take the community back. We've got to say, okay, we might be afraid. But I always use John Wayne as an example. He had a great statement. Being, uh, having courage was not being unafraid. Having courage was being afraid and saddling up anyway. And that, so we got to saddle up uh, individuals. But I wanted to bring up a point about this uh, lady, Pat, Margaret Reams, and that court watch system. There is an example, a great example of what we're talking about here, is four individuals who are willing to go down and stand in that courtroom and talk to the judge and do this repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly without any monetary compensation, without the hour after hour, after, even sleeping in the courtroom on occasion, and in the hall outside of that courtroom to get it the neighborhood's position across. They actually stopped one lady in the courtroom. She's pleading her case. She has a job now. She has a job at the Burger King, I believe it was, on 10th Street. Uh, one of the court watch personnel interrupted the court and pointed out to the judge that Burger King had been closed five years ago. And if they hadn't been willing to do that, the lady didn't leave the courtroom, let's put it like that. My understanding was she went there to another room in the, in the building uh, because they were uh, there doing that job. We need to get that. I would like to see some of the prosecutor's office, some of the uh, East District office get behind that group again. It seems like it's fallen off, to be my honest opinion. Well, I, I, I can assure you that... Uh, Annie, Nikina, Michelle, Ann, uh, any of our community prosecutors would gladly recruit volunteers for impact panels as well. And we're constantly, uh, anytime we're out in front of the neighborhood associations, asking individuals if they're willing to serve on impact panels to do exactly what you said. Okay, let's try and get those, yeah. Ms. Donna, we'll yeah. Yeah, we'll go ahead and then we'll... 
Okay, Dr. Hipple, I had a question about your research. So when you've been doing your research and you're talking to people, I imagine in the communities, because I talk to the people in the community, and so my question is, do you get a lot of, it's none of their business? Because what I hear a lot from the youngsters, especially in the shooting incident that he was talking about, which I know some of those teenagers, and a lot of their thing is, well, they weren't after me, it's none of my business, they probably did something wrong. So that's my question is like, are you seeing that? And then my other thing is, in a separate incident that I know that I was a witness to the incident, there was a shooting, but no one was shot. And he was talking about the understaffing. So do you find that maybe there's, there's tension between the police and the, the, the um, witnesses? Because when people were trying to tell the police what were going on with this shooting, there was a statement made by an officer, well, no one was shot, because I asked, why is there only one cop here? There was 12 shots fired. There was one cop. He said, well, no one was shot. There was two ladies that literally, the guys were hiding by their house before they jumped out. They identified them. They never came back. And then there were kids in the neighborhood that all watched the guys sneak up. And the officer said that the kids' statements were not, they told the kids to be quiet and go home. So my question is about, you know, what you're finding in your research, and then are you finding that some of them is just, it's really none of my business. These teenagers nowadays is kind of just like, as long as they're not after me, you know. Right. Not right. even this, it's not even a snitch thing. They're literally like, no, it doesn't actually, have anything to do um, with it. First, let me just say, I, I can't comment on anything on the police department and that, like that, I, I would defer to anyone over there to talk about right. that. Um, we have, we hear, we don't track the shots fired because if we did, we would be just, right. it would be out of control, right? So I, I can't speak to that particular case. But as far as what you're talking about, it's none of my business. The, the book out there is by a guy named Elijah Anderson. It's called Code of the Streets. And he talks about this exact type of thing. So it's not a snitching mentality per se. It's just kind of the, the environment. And so if we can change this Code of the Streets, if the neighborhoods can come together, if people can come together and be willing to, to call the police, stay on the line, talk to the police officers, that would change this culture, this code of the streets. And it's, again, it's, it's by uh, um, uh, Elijah. He actually wrote a second book, a follow-up to that. And he talks about this exact thing, where it's not necessarily snitching. They're not necessarily afraid. It's just, you just don't do it. And it's just the code and the environment that they're in. So um, we're, like I said, we're starting, hopefully, to, get, um, to talk to people to get more into that. And those are going to be some of the kind of questions. What can we do to change that? Like, that would be a great question. What can we do to make it your business? Because it should be your business. Do they have, my question is, is, do they have night court so that us working people could go and stand up for these criminals? No. They make it, no. I know, it's an eight to five job. And what gets me about that is most of the hard working people, and not the retired people, I'm not making fun of them or nothing, they have more time to go downtown and do this. And it's wonderful that they do that, and I'm proud of them. But our society does not, if, if we're getting to be such a big town, and we're getting to be a lot of trouble, a lot of shots and stuff, I know they have night court in other states. I think we need to look into well, that. Well, I mean, there, there are some minor courts that perhaps we didn't have the major felony courts they, they basically are at eight to five schedule no question yeah, about I mean, it I know. now having said that there are certainly ways that anyone could have input uh, i mean if you're aware of a, of a case um, and uh, that impacts your neighborhood and and you contact our office and we know who the deputy prosecutor is assigned I mean, if you're interested enough to have input on what that person receives, we, at a minimum we could get a letter from you uh, that could be submitted as part of the sentencing. You know. so, wow. but, 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 well, but what I'm but, saying is, is it, it's a good thought that everybody's saying that we need to get involved. Well, I think the system's old and archaic and that we need to reevaluate the system. I, I would just say that I have no control over the court schedules. <laughs> in fact, if I don't show up when they say, then... then well, I bet you're under a lot of scrutiny, but <laughs> you're an elected official, but um, you do a fantastic job. I'm not making fun of you. 
It's okay. just that I don't, I don't feel like that of all of Indianapolis is being represented ever at any particular time because it's only this, like you say, you have an alumni. Well, you have alumni of people that show up to these meetings too. So no, you're, you're exactly right. that I'm might be here. something you need Let's to start look back at. there. Yes, ma'am. You stated that uh, areas that has a lot of abandoned homes, boarded up homes, whatever. Another issue that I have in my area, 46208 near the 38th and Meridian, Illinois, Capital Gas Stations is, if that's what you want to call them, convenience stores, is that they're putting them up almost every four blocks. Mm -hmm. We've got the two at 38th Street, Meridian, I'm sorry, Illinois and Capitol. They're putting one up at 34th and Capitol. They're wanting to put one up at 32nd and Central. And I think that because of the way they run these gas stations and the disregard for the community and the type of clientele they have there, it's a, I call it a hub for crime. So I think that means. Yeah, at a minimum, it's, it, it's a nuisance. They create a nuisance situation. Yeah. They do, and, and hang uh, out. And you know, it, it's sort of beyond our jurisdiction, but it gets to my point about uh, the collective effort of all agencies, you know, whether it's zoning, uh, allowing them to build that in the first place. Uh, and you know, I'm sure Deb Law back there would be happy to. Uh, talk about those subjects as well. She's one of our community prosecutors and you know, we try to work you know, with city legal and, and city agencies in addressing these, these issues. Uh, can we do a better job? Absolutely. And let me just, it's a great point you bring up because there's now this whole, and you speak about abandoned houses, there's a, there's a methodology to look at what they call risky terrain and what the terrain is that leads to shootings and convenience stores is one of those. It's, it's unique to each jurisdiction. So it could be, uh, you know, something different in a different in a different city in Detroit or St. Louis or some of the other cities. But that's a pattern we've recognized in our non-fatal shooting meetings. Is it something about uh, either the 24-hour gas stations or the convenience stores or however you want to call them? But it creates this risky terrain. But these the terrains build upon each other. So in addition to that, it's the abandoned houses that are on top of that, and uh, you know other issues that kind of build to create this risky terrain where if it's just in a convenience store by itself and there's none of this other risky stuff that goes with it, it might be all right. And so we're, the research is looking at that and I'm hopeful that we can bring some of that forward to Indianapolis and to the policymakers so they can take this collective look that the prosecutor is talking um, about. Let's take a couple more and then uh, we'll give away and then, one second, uh, take a couple more questions because we committed to get everyone out here. Eight. Give away the door prizes, and then I'll happy to stay and talk to anyone who has any additional questions. Thought as long as you want, but so yes, sir. You know, this bullet point talks about building a bridge of trust, and I just want to know if you can speak about certain perceptions. Um, there was an article in the paper just yesterday that I was reading in regards to sentencing when it comes to gun crimes. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah, uh, okay. but you know, just in, in, in reading the paper and reading about some of these shootings. Um, and you start to see who the culprits um, are, and you see that they're rap sheets. And you know, on occasion, I'll read where the person who committed the crime might have been locked up just recently for a armed robbery, and he might have did one or two years. And immediately, I'm thinking, why was he out one or two years? Um, you know, he should still be in jail. So, as far as trust is concerned, and, and, and wanting people to speak up and speak out. Um, doesn't that hurt the trust when, you know, the person might just assume that, well, you know, I'm going to go through all this, the, the risk of speaking out and, and trying to get this person locked up when, you know, the thought might be, well, they, they'll probably do a year and they're already out on the streets again. So I'm creating this risk for myself. Is the risk worth, worth the reward? Uh, and what do you guys think about that? Well, I, I guess I have several observations, and, and number one, I, I think it does, and, and, and I'm not saying this to be critical at all, because I think, you know, we sort of hear this thing from, um, you know, the press and, 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 and the sometimes uh, other public officials about this broad generalization about the revolving door of the jail and everything, and, and I, I think that does a great disservice to, to all of us in public safety, because 
it's not necessarily the case. Uh, and, and I'll give you a perfect example. Um, the, and it leads to this mistrust. And, and I want to answer a second part of your question about sentences as well. Uh, I'll get to that. But the, the, the killing of Officer Wren uh, that occurred, uh, there were some in the city who immediately were decrying that, yeah, here was this another person who had this long rap sheet, uh, another felon turned loose uh, who now has turned around and committed this crime. Absolutely not true. And, uh, and so in other words, again, that, that, that you know, some who should know better in the public could put that out there, that particular defendant um, who's now charged with, with murder in that case had one prior conviction for a misdemeanor in like 2008. Uh, so, so again, are there situations where people have, have you know, gotten a sentence and, and got it early? Yeah, and there were all kinds of aberrational uh, situations of Seamus Patton. Was a perfect example of the, the, the person who shot seven or eight people at Black Expo several years ago uh, gets a 16 year sentence and he's out like in four. Well, what had happened was, you know, over the years, as, as uh, the legislature had built in credit time for various things, even though you, you get a 16 year sentence, automatically you get half time for good time, so you serve eight. And then you get additional credit time if you complete certain programs, you know, whether it's drug treatment or you get a GED. So suddenly a six-year sentence turns into two or three-year sentence. And, and I absolutely agree with you in that that sort of thing creates cynicism and mistrust. So, but what the legislature's done in response to all of us complaining about those sort of things and with the new code is that they've limited those credit time uh, abilities and, and serve 75% of your sentence as opposed to half your sentence. Now correspondingly, they've, they've reduced the sentences, but the point is to have a little more certainty in the sentence just so that doesn't happen, you know, where those sort of aberrational results. Uh, um, but I agree with your fundamental point that to the extent they do happen, I don't think it happens as often as, as the if people are led to believe by ones who uh, put that point out there. Uh, but it does create mistrust. So, uh, okay, we'll take two more. Carolyn? I actually didn't have a question. I wanted to speak to the lady's comment about court watch. Uh -huh. um, I've had the same, um, I had, had found out about court watch when I came to the Community Justice Academy the first time, which was, this is my third time. And I thought it sounded like an interesting and worthwhile program, but like you, I have to work full time. And, uh, but I wanted to um, tell you about some things you can do. And you can do them, I know you can do them because I'm doing them. Um, you can get involved in Crime Watch. Um, each uh, police district has a monthly police community task force meeting. You can go to those. Um, I have been amazed at the number of free workshops um, put on by IMPD and uh, the prosecutor's office that, you know, wonderful free education, and they're on Saturdays or, or evenings. Uh, a lot of special community events that you can get involved uh, in through the police department. Um, you can go to city county council meetings, uh, the committee meetings, public safety and criminal justice, that's all in the evening, Wednesday evenings. Um, you can get to know, of course, get to know your neighbors and get to know the community relations officer. And if your district is lucky enough to still have one, crime, crime watch specialist uh, in your police district. Um, you can also report lights out to IPL. You can report graffiti. You can report issues to the uh, code, Department of Code Enforcement and the Health Department. Um, you can get involved in neighborhood cleanups. And, um, you know, that's just, that's just the start. I mean, you can write letters. There are a lot of things that those of us that work full time can't do, but these are some things that, that we can do. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I'd like to follow up on something this gentleman was on. Just within the last week or so on television, uh, there was an interview, uh, I believe it was with the judge in Florida, and apparently they have a state law that if you're convicted for a crime, you serve the full time. No good time off. If, it doesn't matter if you had a previous record or non-previous record. If you're convicted for something and you are 
sent to prison for X number of years according to the crime, you stay there that full time. Now, I realized if we did that to everybody, we'd have to double or triple our prison people, but would that, uh, would that be something that could be doable in the state of Indiana if we would pursue it? Yeah, and so, it's called uh, we'd go to the senators, Congress, whatever, you yeah, know. I mean, the legislature sets those sort of things, and you know, I'll just be completely honest, I don't think it's realistic to think that the Indiana legislature would go there. And in particular, uh, um, one part of what you mentioned about good time is, is there, there has to be good time. And, and the whole point of having good time is to give those uh, folks going to the Department of Correction an incentive to actually uh, behave while they're there. Because uh, if, if, if it, there was no good time, then there's going to be a significant number of folks who go in DOC who are going to completely incorrigible uh, while they're there. And okay. so, so th that, that's the fundamental point. And clearly, you know, we want individuals who are going to the DOC to come back and, and become productive citizens. I mean, uh, you know, no matter how much you want uh, you know, someone to go away for committing a crime, you know, the vast, vast majority of those people are going to come back into our community. Thousands of men and women come out of the DOC back into Marion County every single year. And you know, that reentry is week three, so you'll hear about that in, in week three uh, as well. And you know, we are, as a prosecutor's officer, 100% on board. And in fact, you'll hear that night how we cooperate in, the, in, in various reentry programs because we, you know, we want individuals who, have, who are coming back to become productive citizens and not reoffend. Uh, let's, uh, I, as I said, I'm happy to stay and, and answer any questions anyone has uh, as long as you want. Uh, but we've got fabulous prizes. I'm going to make Nikita draw them out again. It's, surely she's trustworthy. <laughs> Before I pull the uh, door prizes, I just want to remind everyone if you return each Monday to bring your folders back with you each Monday. And thanks again for participating. And again, Deborah, thank you so much for coming and sharing.